Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MHCR first webinar of the series in collaboration with the Parachute People. Um, this webinar is titled A New Realm of Peace Building, Exploring the Intersection of Community, Play, Well-Being, and Resilience. Um, so I'm Cam Castro. I'll be serving as the moderator for, for tonight's event. I work with MHCR. I've been working here for the past two years, um, serve as communications officer, um, so I handle anything that goes out for us, um, social media, website, you name it. And yeah, so I'd like to let the parachute people introduce themselves and they'll get into a little bit of what their work has done over the years. Um, and I'll let Nick introduce himself first since he's the link between our two organizations. The link. Wada, if that's how you pronounce your name, I'm super glad that you got to play at eForest. You might have been with Ron maybe on a Casey if he's on the call. Um, my name is Nick Sherwood. So uh, I'm on the board of directors of the Parachute People, one of the co-founders. I also serve as the associate director of the Mary Hoke Center for Reconciliation, which is the sponsor of this. Um, I am in hopefully last year of my PhD, also at the Carter School in Conflict Analysis and Resolution. Uh, my research and practice focus broadly on uh, mental health in conflict contexts, in peace building, uh, super interested in community led and defined interventions to promote uh, mental health and well being in, um, in the peace building field. And uh, yeah, I'm the bridge um, between these two organizations. Here's your people, people happen first. MHCR people happen second. And so it's been a kind of a cool journey to figure out how to integrate um, these two spheres of my personal and professional lives. Uh, Anna, over to you. Cool. Um, sorry if you guys can hear all of the lawn mowing happening outside. It's very loud for me, so hopefully it's not for you guys. Um, but I'm Anna. Um, I've been with the parachute people since 2015, I think, when I met Ron at a TED Talk at Ohio State. Um, so that was super exciting, and I've kind of just been helping out ever since, um, seeing it from the very beginning stages up until now that we're a nonprofit, so that's been great. Um, when I'm not doing Parachute People stuff, I live in Colorado. I have my own graphic design business, um, and I'm usually traveling somewhere, so that is my story right now. Uh, over to Reed. Hi, I'm I'm Reed. Um, I first kind of got in contact with the parachute people in 2016 through Ron and then got really involved in 2019. Um, when I'm not with the parachute people, um, I just moved to San Francisco and I work for biotech startups. And then I also have a couple other mental health organizations that I work on where I'm really interested in um, advancing peer mental health resources and empowering uh, people with tools that they can use on their own outside of a professional setting. Popcorn Ron. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ron and I am based here in Columbus, Ohio. I've been doing the parachute people formerly known as Rooshoot since the very beginning with a couple close friends. And it's been like incredibly amazing everything that we're actually here right now because never in a million years would I've thought that this simple idea to uh, just bring people together and bring back the best day of gym class is now here in academia space. So thank you so much, Cam, for inviting us to share our story. Yeah, for, thank you guys for introducing yourselves. And yeah, if you guys wanted to, you know, go ahead and, you know, tell the audience a little bit about what, what it is you guys do, how you guys came to be. Um, Yep, we can go ahead and get started with that. Ron, over to you, brother. Thank you. So what we have here is the our beautiful PowerPoint, a new realm of peace building. Let's hit the slide. All right, so uh, how we've gathered and organized our power, PowerPoint presentation here, I'm going to go lead you in with the origin story, go through a few key questions what we do as the parachute people, why are we in this work? Um, who, do we, who have we collaborated with? We'll then go into programming, a little bit of 
uh, what we do, what we call um, activations. And that's essentially our bread and butter of what we do, play with the parachute. Um, we have the parachute playground and panels and workshops. And lastly, we're gonna go tie it all together, how the parachute people and peace building, what kind of impact we've been having and what our hopes are for the future. Slide. All right, so this has been a long thing coming. And um, like I said, back in 2014, this was just like a simple idea of trying to create as much fun as possible with as many people as possible. And over the years, we have just been really fine tuning of like our mission of like why we really wanna do this. And as the parachute people, uh, we became a nonprofit in 2019 and came together to have a mission to create community through play to empower personal well being. And our vision is to have a world that views play as integral to mental health and well being. And uh, we do this by advocating for an accessible mental health care system, a holistic approach to health and wellness, the elimination of mental health stigma, the education of communities on well being strategies, peer focused wellness resources, and the celebration of mental wellness. Slide. Yeah, and right here, just um, a lot of our core, core values of why we do what we do. As you can see, I can just read, read a few. We have empathy, friendship, mindfulness. And mindfulness, I just wanna do a, a really quick dive into it. Like, it's hard to uh, talk about it, um, something that's very interactive and integral, um, but playing with the parachute, um, all of us here on the board with, except for Cam, which we'll get you to play with the parachute very soon. All of us here on the board just really um, have experienced this true mindfulness moment where everything is just blocked out and you are just fully in the moment, playing with the parachute, just reliving some childhood memories, sharing a laugh with a stranger and nothing else really matters except for you and the people around you. And this mental fitness, um, Reed will go into that a little later, we have the community and resilience and all of these here just encompass what we do and what we believe as the parachute people. And this right here, just a little um, overview of where, like, where our impact has kind of taken us since 2014. As you can see, we have, we have made our, we made some like awesome waves in five different continents. Um, I can share that in Africa, we donated a parachute to <clears throat> A village in Kenya, or a, vi a village, Senya village in Ghana, um, through a um, through a collaboration with a nonprofit called the Akunami Foundation. Um, all the way over, on the right, we have a, a donated parachute to um, a school in the Philippines. Up there in green in Europe, we've had um, a collaborative effort of uh, bringing the parachute to France at a festival called Le Musilac. Um, thanks to um, our other board member, Casey. Um, Anna and I have popped the parachute in the city of Amsterdam in Netherlands. And um, shooting over to the left, we've, uh, we've donated parachutes, or we've brought parachutes to Mexico, and as you can see, all over the US. And back to our bread and butter parachute activations. These two pictures here are actually from this, uh, this past summer, left one being Bonnaroo hosted in Tennessee and the right being Electric Forest um, hosted in Michigan. And um, both of these feature our largest uh, parachute, which is like 45 feet of fun. And it can be packed shoulder to shoulder like at any one time with this parachute, we can get upwards to a hundred people in on this activation. And on the right, you can see, it's just, um, it's just a really cool spectacle. Um, this year was especially like different and magical because um, on the right here at Electric, uh, at Electric Forest, we commissioned and collaborated with um, a local artist to create this giant custom made mandala um, that we debuted at Electric Forest. And this is where we would love to go to kind of really mix um, health and the arts, like playing and and just really blowing people's minds with just like unique experiences as you see here. 
Um, time for me to talk. So I, I'd like to introduce one of our programs, which is called the Parachute People Playground. And we came up with this idea really to extend the length of interaction, depth of interaction that people can have while they interact with the parachute with us. Um, this kind of idea of like what happens if we make like a permanent parachute bloom. The bloom is that large kind of room that gets made by the that by the people that are playing together, and we um, were able to do this in a really large way at Bonnaroo this year, which is a really big festival in uh, in Manchester, Tennessee. Um, I think there's about eighty thousand people there, and we created this space to encourage people to play. Um, we had lots of bubbles and games. Um, we had a peer well-being wall where people were taking questions and answering questions about mental health and mental fitness to um, kind of put that power back into people's hands about, um, about their mental health and about their own health. And then we also had guided mental health questions where we had like questions on the table and um, people were able to use toys as a way to kind of symbolically talk about their mental health. Um, for this program, one of the ways that we, some of the ways that we measure success were in participation. Um, so we had about 250, 275 people every hour stop by and interact with the playground in some way, which we think is an actual quantifiable mental health interaction to get people to understand that they can play and have um, this in their life. And then also just testimony of, of people uh, enjoying, enjoying the space, being able to um, have kind of like tearful conversations, even amidst a, a festival about their lives. Um, we also had almost 800 people take photos at the photo booth. So that's really cool to see um, all the different people that were impacted by that in this like new form and new program that, we, that we've been rolling out. I think we have a lot of potential here. Um, so these, these are just some more pictures of kind of the uh, zany nature of, of this thing. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that's all to say about it right now. Oh, one thing, this handsome fellow on the right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> should be here, but he's about to board a flight if he hasn't boarded already. Um, he's our last board member who's not here, unfortunately. Um, you good with this read? Mm -hmm. okay. His name is Casey Michael. <laughs> so um, panels and workshops, our third work stream, activity work stream. Um, so I know some of y'all, um, and I'm guessing some of the folks who are on the call are Carter School folks and or grad students in peace and conflict resolution field. Um, workshops have been talked about since, oh, I don't know, the social psychologists <clears throat> in the mid 20th century trying to figure out Israel-Palestine. Um, it's a really prominent thing, um, really prominent uh, um, activity and peace building. The goal is to either one of two things. One, bring together people who otherwise would not be bring together or two, to teach, coach, facilitate the learning of um, practical skills. Uh, we piloted workshops in the spring of 2019 at a community get together in Nashville, Tennessee. The parachute people first brought our workshops to Bonnaroo in 2019. And then we did a sort of new and revamped iteration at Bonnaroo this year. Um, this is uh, what I'm super passionate about in terms of the work that we do. Um, so kind of in two buckets one is the the workshop side and so my goal always for workshop participants attendees is to bring something home with you um i think uh, especially in the peace building field it's nice to go to lectures and to hear these panels and go to these conferences and people talk about these kind of highfalutin ideals um, about how the world should be um they're creating this ideal right if we're not given the skills and abilities to make that ideal world a reality, I think that we're missing a really important piece of the puzzle. So that undergirds um, my workshop philosophy. What we've done at Bonnaroo and other places 
uh, interpersonal conflict resolution, which is a huge reason that um, there's overlap between parachute people, Mary Hoke Center, Carter School. Resilience during stressful times. This is what I'm writing my dissertation on. Um, something that I'm uh, really passionate about is everyone can exhibit resilience during challenging or stressful times. Um, we all have unique and really cool ways of mobilizing resilience within our own lives. Um, and then this last topic was a panel that my co-chair, Danny, I think who's on the call right now, he and I facilitated with um, some cool little rock stars, some kids from uh, Brooklyn the Bluff and from Coin, And we talked about uh, what were challenges to musicians in the music industry during COVID? Um, how do they stay resilient or not? How do they stay connected to their community and their fans or not? Um, some of the metrics of success, and again, if it's uh, Carter School folks, especially if you take in our monitoring and evaluation class, this should be a term that's uh, really familiar to all of y'all. In peace building world, much to my chagrin, we are obsessed with what metrics of success are. What does it mean to enact positive social change <clears throat> within a given context. Um, I know Cam knows this and the board knows this. I really have issues with a lot of quantitative measures um, of understanding success in conflict contexts. Uh, so most of what I define success in these spaces is qualitative. Yeah, participation, right? So the goal is always, I think this is true of teaching and of uh, workshop facilitation. You should be really happy. 50% of your audience is participating. Um, like I said earlier, practical skills developments. And so um, I was able to have some really cool follow-up conversations with participants at Bonner this year. So, hey, what was a, a new source of resilience in your life that you didn't identify as such? Uh, the next time that stress is really getting to you, how are you gonna activate and mobilize that source of resilience? And then this final thing uh, touches into some cool psych literature this idea that when you're engaging in deep conversation a, a conversation one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting growth evolution transformation they happen at the the uh the challenge edge the challenge curve you're slightly uncomfortable because you're going deeper than you might want to be going but not deep enough that you're getting scared and so I can judge um, a facilitation based off of, uh, uh, it's hard to explain. It's like when you're stressed, but in a good way, which is called you stress in literature. You're, you're really primed. Um, you're singularly focused on a specific task. You're, you might be revealing a little bit more about who you are, what your um, formative experiences are, what your deep beliefs about the truth of the world are. Um, so in, uh, in our facilitations, how often are we able to kind of get at that growth challenge curve? We've got some photos. So here on the right hand side, that's me. I am so sweaty. This was Thursday at Bonnaroo. I'm wearing my little CV Nicks hat. Um, over here on the right hand side, that's Joseph Jenkins, who's been an old friend and a former, former board member of the Parachute People and a very close friend of mine. On the left-hand stage, we got um, had the amazing privilege and opportunity to get on stage at Bonner this year. Uh, I'm on the left with that little funky purple thing. Danny Schwartz, also in attendance tonight, is in the funky yellow thing. And then we have uh, two artists from uh, Brooklyn the Bluff and Coin, and then the manager of uh, the Brooklyn the Bluff. And this was the mental health and music industry panel. Over to you, Anna. Cool, thank you. Um, so our impact, um, it's a little bit tough to quantify, but by our estimates, uh, we've impacted over a million people since starting all of this in 2014. Uh, Ron kind of talked through the continents that we've been on. Uh, we've been to 19 major music festivals and probably dozens more smaller events, uh, and then 175 plus concerts. Um, Estimating during like a typical activation with the blooms and the activities under the parachute that we impact 100 people at a time. Um, and at a bigger event like Bonnaroo, um, per day, probably impacting an average of 800 people with the parachute, that not including our workshops and the playground. 
um, and everything else that we do at events like that. Um, so, and that's that always includes people that are actually engaged in the parachute, all of our volunteers that are around, um, people just watching from afar, like what's going on over there. <laughs> like I'm interested, but don't want to directly engage. Um, so it's always a good time. But I think our true impact stands in kind of the smaller moments and the lasting impressions that we leave with people that um, join our community and that have been impacted by a bloom or have experienced this for themselves. So things like uh, elaborate surprise proposals. I maybe Ron jump in if you know a number. There's been a tons that I don't even know of. I think at Bonnaroo this year we had three. Is that right? Three. Cool. Um, and then stories of people meeting their soul sister, their best friends by doing this. I know I've met plenty of my best friends through this organization. Um, people experiencing moments of pure bliss while listening to their favorite artists um, and then reconnecting to their youth through parachute play, which kind of leads me into the next slide. Um, I just want to share some stories that I've heard since being involved um, that really, for me, illustrate the impact that we make. Um, so just scrolling through our Instagram, people are very open about their experiences with the parachute, which I think is really, really cool. Um, like on the left, there's a photo of the parachute, I think, at a local Columbus school. Um, and then just a comment just about how we're doing something so great as a middle school teacher. I wish you could have a program to go to that young of ages. It's already needed. So I think that's something we're kind of starting to get a little bit more involved in. And, you know, we want to continue to donate parachutes and this type of programming to younger kids. Um, on the right, I'm just going to read a little section of this for people who can't see this screen. Um, it's somebody that said, I neglected my mental health for a long time until I started regularly coming to Bonnaroo and living by the radiate positivity mantra. But seeing you guys in 2015 and hearing the positivity and important messages y'all preached during my experience with the Roo shoot was eye-opening. I've learned so much through each experience and post, um, just regular posts on Instagram. So uh, we get comments like that all the time, which always reinforces to me why I do this. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, so on the left is a photo of Ron and myself with a girl that we met at Okeechobee. Um, this was one moment that I experienced where I think this was when we did um, the big quiet, which is a mass guided meditation. Um, and then we did a little bit of parachute activity and play. Um, and Ron and I were packing up the parachute, which is always a moment when people tend to come up because they're like, oh, this is these are the people who do this. So we always have some really, really cool um, interactions with people during that. And this girl came up and she was like, I just want to thank you guys so much for what you do. Um, this was the first time I really was able to open up and say out loud that I'm struggling. And to me, I took that as maybe because of what we're doing, this one girl like jump started her journey to wellness. Um, and that's pretty awesome. Um, and then on the right is a guy from Lighthouse Behavioral Health Solutions in Columbus. And we were part of their open house. Um, and this guy was so happy. We, we gave him this Polaroid. He asked us for another one. And then um, when he walked away taking that Polaroid, I just overheard him say to his friend, like, man, playing with that parachute was the most fun I've had in a long time. And then the other guy was like, yeah, and we were sober because, you know, they're they're going through recovery. So to hear that and hear that we kind of reintroduce somebody to a type of play and fun that they haven't done in their adult life, that's really awesome, too. So um, I'll open the floor if you guys wanted to add anything else on impact. Yeah, so um, the played forward parachutes, um, like Anna was saying uh, with that photo of um, us interacting with the local school here in Columbus, um, that's something we want to um, eventually explore and we are working towards. Um, what played forward parachutes is, is a community give back program to local schools um, in search for a school that needs either a new gym class parachute or has never had one. And since we've been doing this, um, I've ran into, had awesome, deep conversations with uh, a lot of early child development, middle school, high school, um, special needs uh, teachers. And they just are the first to like share, like, this is the favorite day of my um, week when I get to bring this out. Uh, uh, you should just see like the, the faces on all these kids. And then I 
just like slyly reply like yep this is why we do it like we're trying to just uh bring back the best day of gym class for a lot of people into the modern day and make those memories into a reality and um yeah every single time i connect with the teacher um they always just reach out and leave a, leave us an email and one like hey like let's stay connected we want to get you to our school and um Within the school, we would love to like host assemblies, focus on topics of mental wellness, mental fitness, and just really how to just balance both the play and the rest, because um, that's um, just as equally important. Like we we focus on playing hard and like just laughing and just go 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 go, but um, very much uh, a part of that is the yang to all of this, and it's uh, just making sure you have good really good sleep hygiene, you're, you're stretching before and after, you're having um, just that eight to 10 hours of sleep. And um, beyond that, we wanna to continue to work with uh, local artists and our community to create these one of a kind murals, just like the ones we had at Electric Forest. And um, right here, I don't know if, uh, do we have Casey still on? And um, is he able, are we late, allowed to give a mic to uh, someone in the audience? Because Parachute Pods is a, um, a beautiful concept that him and I have been trying to parse out. Casey, can you talk at all? If not, that's totally all right. Oh, he's on the plane, everyone. It's a little loud. Oh, no. <laughs> that's all right. I want to give a lot of kudos and uh, praise to uh, Casey with this parachute pod idea. Um, a little bit about Casey. Um, he is, um, <laughs> yeah, he is camp daddy. He, he loves to uh, just um, take charge and make sure all of, all of the people at his camp at Bonnaroo or wherever he is, is having a good time. He's the most excellent host. And it's, it's very on brand for Casey to have um, this parachute pod, pod concept uh, be of his like him and I have been talking about developing communities of parachute people um, in major cities I mean between the board members here on this call Anna is in Colorado Reed is currently in California Nick I think you're in uh, Georgia right now and Casey being in uh, between DC and um, Georgia all of us here have these little networks these little nodes or parachute pods and uh, we want to take the con we want to continue the conversation from these festivals from these community events and really have a more consistent dialogue going on so we can really um, really focus on our mission of creating community through play and um, yeah that's it with that all right I'm gonna stop sharing screen so for our beautiful audience we had uh about 30 minutes um for cam to do some facilitation and then 30 minutes of open discussion but you know um the more participation and the more fluid this goes i think the better but uh yeah cam brother what you got yeah so um so specifically going off of anna's presentation on impact and everything I want to know, you know, why why you go why you guys chose music festivals of all places? Cause you know, I mean, I personally haven't been to a music festival myself, but I, you know, I just know that, you know, there may be like certain like connotations or like, you know, it can be places of wild things or dysfunction, but you guys somehow find a way to bring everything together. So I kind of have two questions. I wanted to one ask why music festivals as the place of choice to bring together people in this form and Going off of that, how do you feel like music plays such a role in you know community building and bringing people together and peace building and reconciliation? Um, and you know the floor is open for whoever wants to go first. I want to ask Nick to talk about why music festivals. That's an easy one. <laughs> um, so there are I'm going to overgeneralize a little bit two. Uh, big paradigms of peace building. Uh, one is, I think, kind of leaving us a little bit, and the other one's on the ascendancy. The first ideal of peace building is that it is third party mediators, arbitrators, reconcilers, whatever. 
going into a conflict context, going into a population that they're not a part of and enacting some sort of program or whatever. Um, a lot of what the US government does is that. Um, some of what the United Nations does is that, although the UN is doing a better job of integrating local buy-in um, and more participatory methodologies uh, for peace building. So you can kind of create two big buckets. One is external interveners. The second, which is what uh, MHCR has thrown our full weight behind and where folks like John Paul Lederach Mark Gothin, um, really prominent uh, practitioners turned scholars um, have challenged the field to do is to start with what you know, start in your own community. Um, uh, peace building has to start in the home and then <laughs> plur, nice, um, and then work its way out. Um, in some ways, I think it was a really happy accident that we started, <laughs> I see you. Um, I think that it was a really happy accident that we we began in music festivals, live music events, and community events. Um, I believe that there are moments of confluence and convergence. I believe that there are moments where certain people and ideals and um, mechanisms of change are brought together. It just so happened that the people who founded the organization, are leading it, and are about it, all love music festivals. That is our adopted community, right? Um, if, for me, it was a very organic growth from Ron bringing a music festival, uh, or bringing a parachute to Bonner 2014 to like, well, and I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit, Ron, but like, you're just trying to hang out, man. Bring a, bring a yeah, yeah bring a parachute, see what happens. Let's, you know, get under it, do some blooms, have some chill talks, whatever. Um, over time, that act of bringing a parachute, which uh, there's, I think, some symbolism in the idea of a parachute that we can unpack at some point. Over time, the question became, uh, one, why are so many people following us on Instagram and sort of obsessed with this thing and wanted to play with it and get involved and are looking for us at festivals and are tweeting and Instagramming and like, oh, y'all going to be at Bonner or E-Force, whatever. It struck a really weird chord. And I firmly believe some of the most effective grassroots led peace building initi initiatives start like that. It was a happy accident. Um, we, and we can get into this a little bit more later. Our nonprofit started the wrong way. We had a movement first and then we added nonprofit status after. Typically you start a nonprofit and then you're kind of hustling. And that's the MHCR model, right? Is we had a group of people come together and Cam, brother, thank you for being on our socials all the time. We are like happy for every single follower we get, every single like on a post we get. Um, at parachute with parachute people, we never had that. So why music festivals? Well, one, we come from the community. And so we're going to speak for the community that we're a part of. We're not speaking on behalf of the community that we're not a part of. And two, I do believe that there were some really cool, whatever forces at play that brought all of us together at the exact right moment. We all have a vested interest in health, well-being, um, and it seemed like a very natural fit. And I don't even know if there was ever a discussion about if this was a mental health organization. We were clarifying and we were distilling about exactly what it was, but the health and well-being piece was always there. And then in some ways, it was there before we had the words to call it that. So that's why we did music festivals. Sometimes I don't know if I ever chose to do it at music festivals. I think the music festivals chose us. <laughs> <laughs> to be these like weird ambassador uh social change agents uh cam what was your other question how do you feel like music is a tool for building community and peace building and everything like what is the connection between the two i was just gonna ask you to talk around <laughs> um Kind of building what uh, Nick said before answering uh, that second question, um, 
Nick, uh, Nick says it's a, he thinks it's a happy accident. Um, I would say it's quite intentional with how everything um, happened. And I say this because um, trying to give context of like how it all began 2014, this was like the advent of social media again, really big via Instagram. This is, this is Instagram before the reels, before TikTok was ever around when the actual timeline was like chronological and hashtags were still a thing. So um, on the parachute, on the very first parachute, um, it had two phrases, um, hashtag roo shoot, so we can find it. So if you can take a picture, you know where to, if you, if you saw someone take a photo, like, oh, maybe we can search the hashtag and like find a photo of us and really just create an online community through that. Um, the other message was very simple and it's, uh, be happy. Um, be happy is um, a very short, shortened version of the longer form of may all beings be happy. And that was birthed out of a 10 day Vipassana meditation. So that's a little bit of the origin story of um, be happy and the hashtag Rushoot. But um, yeah, since then, like um, music and peace building, um, Bonnaroo, if you know anything about the music festival scene, it's probably the closest thing going to Woodstock. I know those are contentious words, but like uh, Bonnaroo is a very hippie, hippie festival. Like it's been known to like, where it's where you go walk barefoot and like listen to the dead and all these jam rock bands. Since then, since its inception in 2002, it has evolved to be a little more inclusive with electronic dance music and other, other genres. But Peace building and music is is just synonymous. It just like it it reverberates so hard, so hard that their mantra is radiate positivity. And when we have the parachute um, from the very beginning, um, one of the messages that uh, me and my friends would just remind people is like, if you had a good time, um, please pay it forward. Like we do this thing for free, so if you um, if you see it in your hearts, just to make sure to do a small act of kindness for someone paid forward three times and then with that we can literally create a ripple effect just as the parachute makes waves um, with anyone that participates um i i was just thinking about like if, if you've ever been to a party or a community event or something and the music shuts off or there's not playing music it just seems like every social interaction is way harder so i feel like in the context of peace building, like, seems like it's easier to have some conversations around that with music. <laughs> I think you're bringing forward a really important point, Reed, about, and Ron, you touched on it too. There is a, um, uh, indelible, um, ephemeral, but, unbreakable connection between the arts and peace. Um, there's a part of the peace building ideas, it's an in inherently, I believe, creative act, which I think it's very interesting that the Carter School has an M a master's of science in peace building rather than a master's of arts. And you can read into that however you want to. Um, there is something unbreakable about the art peace relationship the relation um we can look at the empirical literature yeah you listen to songs that you know help you not feel as sad or you listen to sad boy sad girl sad they them music and you want to feel more sad and that's okay too right or you go put on odessa which i don't know if anyone's seen the new tour danny and on i know y'all have um you get pumped right uh i one of the reasons that Parachute People has worked, I think, is that there's a constant backdrop. Well, one, if you're at the show together, you obviously have at least some similar taste or a willingness to explore that taste. And two, the whole time that we're parachute activating or playgrounding or workshopping or whatever, there's a constant backdrop um, of a shared experience together. And if you're the type of person who self-selects to go to a concert or a festival or a community event, you're someone who's probably going to be deriving more experience from that than someone who wouldn't be going to those events, which is already priming you to be in sort of a place where maybe peace is possible. 
And then what we're just doing is we're just adding sort of a cherry on top of it. Um, yeah, what a, I yeah, I, I would love to dig into that. Um, connection between peace and resilience and yeah, how that comes in the music space. That, that's an important conversation. Um, but yeah, other comments on the role of music in what we do in music and peace building. Just a super quick add um, on the events that we do that are not based on music events. Um, so Lighthouse Behavioral Health Solutions, we've uh, partnered with them several times at some of their open houses. Um, and the first time we did it, it was beautiful, amazing. We got to pull people in from the sides that were looking at it like, I'm not going to play. I'm not going to be involved in that. And by the end of it, they were, and they had a great time and they were able to connect with new people. Um, we had the music going, bubbles, toys, parachutes. Um, and then another event, our, uh, Bluetooth, our big Bluetooth speaker was not working. So it was just us playing with the parachute and Ron doing his thing underneath the blooms and people still have fun. Like everybody was still smiling and laughing, but there, something was missing. Like music is just inherently, I think, part of that community, that pop-up community that we build, um, no matter where we go. So. Yeah, so thank you guys for sharing. You guys shared a lot about, you know, the why music festivals and also why, you know, why music is so intrinsic to peace building and community building. So going off of that, you guys are very much practice based in, you know, in in using your impact. And, you know, so you guys have a big focus on what it means to, you know, be mentally fit. And, you know, you guys, you guys come at your practice from a mental health informed side. So I wanted to ask, how does, how does, you know, using mental health informed practice, how have you guys seen that, I guess, help bridge divides between some of the different groups that come together at the events that you guys do in terms of, because, you know, I know that, you know, the parachute is representative of people from all races, genders, orientations, and, you know, with you guys having that mental health informed practice, how have you seen that, have you seen that play out in practice? I guess is the question. Yeah, I've seen um, <clears throat> I've seen this play out um, numerous times. Uh, a lot of a lot of what I see uh, when it comes to the interactions is um, the stark difference in age um, when it outside of the music festival realm, like when I take this out into the Columbus community, um, uh, I've, I've taken it to, let's see, it's what's called ComFest Community Festival, which is a, a major like local festival here in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, I see really, <laughs> I, I guess uh, you're um, a conservative white male sort of stereotype playing with like, um, just like this hippie kid, um, very loose, like tie dive, like I'm pretty sure he had a joint in his hand and all of that there didn't matter. Like when, when the parachute is there, um, it's, it's totally just being in the moment. So there's less of a dialogue of politics or anything like that, but it's just like leading by example of interactions of seeing these two different communities, um, come together in such a very bright and peaceful way, but um, without without this social lubricant of a parachute, you would not have seen this. Yeah, kind of to just expand on my question a bit more is, you know, have you guys, have you got, um, I think Anna, you had mentioned um, how somebody was talking about, you know, this was the first time that they had, you know, openly talked about their struggles. So kind of, you know, Coming from that aspect of you guys being aware of the mental health, the psychological resilience aspect of your work, like, I guess my question is more centered around how have people, how have you seen people like, you know, get in touch with their mental health through your events and, you know, how, how has that played out in, I guess, helping them be more open to, um, you know, bridging divides between different groups that you may not normally see? I think, um, one thing I've noticed through lots of different mental health awareness work is that people are really just 
when there is that excuse to talk about mental health, like when somebody breaks that ice, breaks that stigma, says it's okay, gives that permission, um, it's like a floodgate. And um, that's one of the things that attracted me to the parachute first is like, okay, why, why are people doing this? Oh, because we think that mental health matters and that play matters for that. And you should be allowed to talk about these things, not just in a sterile office, but wherever, with whomever. And um, consistently throughout, like I, my workshops are peer groups. And so I'll just, I'll take like a smaller parachute where you can sit like eight people around it and sit down in the grass and ask people to tell each other their mental health stories. Um, and just like having that, being that, um, that permission or that, yeah, really just being that permission to talk about mental health is, is often like all that it takes for somebody to really open about it. And like, I can see it in people when they hit their, like the statement that they needed to create by showing up in that day. Um, you know, it, people like have a weird little shiver through their body or they get, they tear up or whatever. And that's oftentimes because there are not a lot of people or organizations out there creating the kind of safe or brave spaces to be able to talk about these things. And I think that um, when people see this beautiful chaos of the parachute and whatever we're doing, the next question is usually, why are you doing that? And um, I think that's really all the excuse that is needed to turn into a longer winded interaction. I want to pop in for a second because it, Reed, you um, you hit on two things. One, uh, and Ron, you talked about this at the beginning of the presentation. Um, one of the core goals of everything that we're doing is to reduce mental health stigma just by talking about it. Uh, when you uh, typically, if you're experiencing anxiety, depression, trauma, stress, da da da, whatever. Um, a lot of folks, myself included, will say, have you thought about talking to a therapist? Have you thought about talking to someone? Because I believe in that model, right? Um, and many of the friends or family members or loved ones or whatever, uh, colleagues that I've had those conversations about, they're already like, well, that's okay. Like talking to a therapist is okay. There are so many folks in the world for cultural reasons, for financial reasons, for structural reasons, for uh, human rights-based reasons. We have seen counselors commit human rights violations against certain marginalized communities, that there are many individuals, communities, um, sectors of society, and I'm speaking in the U about the US context right now, who are really uncomfortable with that. And so one thing that we do is reduce, to make, reduce stigma via peer-to-peer -peer conversations. Um, no one on the board is a licensed professional counselor. And I wanna make that very, very effing clear that that's not, we can't make any types of claims to that. Um, the second thing that you brought up, Reed, that I wanna highlight is when you said, you can tell when someone has said the thing they wanted to say and maybe they tear up or you're watching a physiological reaction I think that there's a profound power in speaking our truth and when folks come into the spaces that we're able to facilitate my hope my hope is that whatever truth you're bringing in hopefully we can make it a little bit easier to talk about. Um, and, and I do believe that there is an, there's another intricate bond um, between living authentically, speaking our truth on, on one side of things, and then protecting, maintaining, strengthening mental health and well-being. Um, so I just wanted to add that. All right, so 
Thank you all for your answers. So another question I wanted to ask next was in terms of, you know, you, you guys also focus on resilience. And, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you all, how does, how does, what does resilience look like to you all? It doesn't even necessarily have to be tied to, you know, the parachute people's work and everything, but just in your experiences, what does, what does a resilient person look like? What does, like, you know, is there a successful example of what resilience is? Is it a case by case basis? Um, if you guys, you know, could just share your thoughts on what that looks like um, and how that's manifested itself in your lives. I can start. Um, <clears throat> when I'm not doing the parachute people, I work at a cancer hospital. So um, I'm in the nursing field and take care of a lot of patient suffering. And resilience to me is like taking care of these patients and realizing that um, that they don't have to be polite. They don't have to be in a good mood. They don't have to like mind their P's and Q's and all this stuff. Like they're like, they're slowly dying at different rates here. And I've been reminded day in and day out as I take care of these patients, I get to know them um, as I clean them, help them walk, what have you. Um, that those that just consistently just have a good attitude, like have little moments of kindness and like share a joke in the midst of a very like troubling and trialing time, that to me is resilience. And I just get inspired by the patients I take care of every day. Thank you for sharing there, Ron. My definition of resilience is uh pretty short you get up one more time than your push down and whatever it takes to you to that point pick yourself right back up get up one more time than your push down i feel like that's a perfect segue into what i was going to add uh so that's great i I like that you uh, so succinctly put that because that's a great example. I was going to say, I don't feel like there's one set example. I feel like resilience is very uh, case by case, but that is a perfect model to look at it, um, to, to kind of build your own case for resilience. Um, so like for me, um, I dealt with a lot of depression when I was younger and I would let it drag me down to really low places. And if anybody here has dealt with depression, you know how easy it can be to just kind of get sucked under and keep getting sucked under and keep getting sucked under. And I vividly remember one day looking at myself in the mirror and I was like, no, I'm better than this. I'm going to figure out how to pull myself up and out of this one little thing at a time, whether that was getting out of bed and brushing my teeth as soon as I got out of bed or whatever it was. It was like adding one thing every day um, and kind of learning my toolkit to overcome that. So as an adult now, um, there's there's bad days and that's okay, but I've learned my toolkit for how to deal with that and how to continue going. So resilience for me is exactly what Nick just said, kind of, wait, how did you say it one more time? You said it so well. Getting up one more time than yeah. your push down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ooh, read any thoughts? Um, I think I would expound a little bit more on the toolkit aspect that you brought up, Anna. Anna. And <laughs> um, I think so much of resilience comes down to the, like, little rituals and habits that we set out for ourselves so like brushing your teeth when you get out of bed all these different things um but i also think like one of the most important tools that we have is talking to those around us and giving voice to what we experience so i, I think i've i've led peer group programs for a while with probably over 200 people and um the biggest thing that i think people get from that is like this realization that whatever they're experiencing they're not alone in it and so i think something that resilient people do is voice what they're going through to other people and that simple act of voicing what you're going through is like welcoming in hope that 
something can be better, right? Um, so I think that's a really important part of resilience. Thank you, Reed. And, and kind of going off of that point, you you all, you know, in the parachute people, the, you know, your organization is also geared towards like community building and everything. And I, you know, um, I guess my next question is, how have you seen being a part of, you know, this community, how has that impacted your mental health or, you know, and just in terms of the bigger scheme of, it doesn't have to be your mental health, but, you know, how do you feel that being a part of a community and being a part of building community, how do you feel like that impacts people's mental health and helps them find, you know, peace within themselves? And, you know, you all can share examples from your own lives or just even some of the other, um, just in some of your experiences, how you've seen like community be a huge um, benefit to people in, you know, in, in their journey. Yeah. Um, going beyond like what we do at music festivals and all of that, like the link to taking that energy and just that sort of like playful environment um, when we're down at Bonnaroo, Electric Forest, what have you. Um, I was inspired to take that and bring it to Columbus. And like I mentioned earlier, I work at a cancer hospital and was quickly reminded by Nick about this awesome video that we did back uh, in 2016. I'm gonna share the link um, in the chat and I encourage you to just give that a look afterwards. But um, this kind of bridges the gap of building community beyond uh, what we normally do. And we took the parachute um, to this hospital and did a little flash mob, um, essentially. And um, what was really cool, we had new technology at the hospital that had um, a closed circuit television that you can live stream whatever you, like scenes from the lobby, scenes from a remote um, camera, and it can stream all throughout all of the, the entire hospital. So um, in June, 2016, it's, um, it's known to be National Cancer Survivor Month. And, um, and with that, uh, I've always thought like, man, it would be really cool to do a flash mob, bring that thing back and like start in the lobby. Like I started like brainstorming with a few coworkers and word got around that um, people want to get involved. So I eventually um, recruited like nurses, um, custodial staff, um, people that worked at the gift shop, inventory, and actually um, um, convinced uh, some cancer survivors themselves to learn a dance within a few weeks and put on essentially what um, this YouTube link is. And building community through that, just like this shared um, common purpose of trying to entertain, do something, doing something new and crazy. Like all of these people have never really done a flash mob and none of them were, professional dancers at all, but um, just through strong will and just passion, like they were able to learn this step within a few weeks and produce this like highly impactful um, collaborative moment um, that was viewed throughout the hospital. And to this day, people still talk about um, this little flash mob we've done. And that was all inspired by what we do with the parachute people. Cool. And so, you know, kind of, I wanted to ask one more question before we got into, um, you know, potential audience questions and everything. Um, so with you all coming from different backgrounds and, you know, not necessarily being, you know, in the academic realm of peace building and everything, what does, what does peace look like to you all in, in terms of like, you know, from your experiences or just your interpretation of it? Um, because I know that, you know, you all come from different areas of, of expertise, but you know, you still come together in this in this community, you know, to help make the world a better place. So how do you, what does peace look like to you and like, you know, in its most ideal form? And, you know, this could be an external thing. This could be, you know, whether you think it's about finding inner peace and everything. Um, yeah, so if you all could share some thoughts about that and what that looks like to you all in your daily lives and interpretations. Easy question, Cam. Thank you. <laughs> what is peace? Uh, for me, 
Well, the first image that came to mind was when I was riding the rail um, at Flume. What summer. does that mean for the lay people? For folks <laughs> who haven't uh, been to Bonner or Bunch Festivals, when you ride the rail, you are front row. You're holding onto the rail. Um, that was a moment hearing you and me by flume with Danny covered in glitter glow six thrilled beyond belief because we did the thing that we set out to do all of us not just me and Danny all of us we did the workshops and the panels and the the whatever taking a longer um kind of time view having inner peace is looking back at the strings of memories of your life and a lot of your life you don't actually remember we have flashbulb memories things that come to us because it was particularly important or eventful or there was something going on whatever um and looking back at those strings of memories over the course of your life and thinking i wouldn't have done anything differently that's what pieces me It's tough to follow that, but um, peace to me. Yeah, yeah. When you mentioned like the inner peace, that's uh, that's something that um, is sometimes missed with what we do, or what I think we do with the parachute people. It's I'm sure we're having this outwardly extension of like playing and having just like really cool connections, meeting new people. But at the end of the day, like the I got to remind myself, uh, the mission is to create community through play to empower personal well-being. And that inner peace is key. Um, and it just reminds me of how I like to leave a lot of the parachute blooms. And the bloom, as you saw, like in a picture, it's where we lift up and go under and create this big giant bubble. Some people call it the mushroom cloud, the shroom, but we want to we want to take that back and we're, it's it's called the bloom. So um, we say that the, this parachute is the stress reducing, positivity producing parachute with a purpose, and that is that is it. It's to be a reminder to be kinder, not only to others but most importantly yourself and peace to me is being able to sit down. Pe some people call it meditating, some people call it praying, or just sit still. And then just really observing and just really tuning everything out and just focusing on the breath. To me, that's peace. Anna, read. It's like you guys have peace nailed down. <laughs> to me, it's like what like global peace. There's so many different uh, facets of peace that I'm like, man, which one to dial into? <laughs> so it's kind of hard. Um, but what I keep kind of circling back to is like community peace and take that as in like your community of friends or the community that you are involved in every day, like having these spaces that are safe. Um, to be able to um, speak what's on your mind, whether that's some conflict that you have um, with somebody or with yourself, and just having communities that help you navigate through these uh, more negative parts of life um, and kind of reach that inner peace or peace within with you and somebody you love. Um, and I think that that's something cool that tying it back to the parachute people that those types of spaces are something that we try to foster um, for ourselves and for our friends and for the people in our community. And I think that's pretty cool. Thank you all for sharing. Um, Reed, any last thoughts or? Um, I don't think I have more to add on what right. pieces. No problem. All right, so um, at this point, if there are any audience questions um, that anyone, you know, wanted to ask the panel and, you know, just everyone related to the parachute people and their work, um, you know, this is your time. You can go ahead and ask some questions. Um, 
if not, I can definitely still ask some questions. I'm very curious. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, if we have any questions, you can just type them in the chat and we'll, we'll put them up for you. MHCR folks, Hannah and Marisa, you better participate. Yep, I'm looking at you. I have a question if, yeah, no, okay. Um, so I'm wondering in what other ways do you incorporate play into your life? So you take play to really big levels, like your daily life, what do you do? Um, yeah, I guess I'm talking. Um, so I, I collect little toys and I bring them around with me basically wherever I go. And like when I meet new people or sometimes like when I'm catching up with a friend, I like have them select four random toys from a bag and like talk about their week within the context of those four toys. Or like I make little like dioramas of things <laughs> all the time. Um, or like when I'm at a concert, I'll like have a slinky or something that I'm playing with. Um, just like all these different like ways that I try to just be more playful in my life. And like, I really started developing that from the parachute people. So um, I became like the toy guy, but um, that's the way that I, I do it. And I think like play can be in everything. Like, um, like it's playful that Ron wore a tie dye shirt with a blazer to an academic conference, you know, like, um, I, I think it can be everywhere and um, you know we've we've even seen applications that can get really serious too like um, one of our community members has a, a board retreat program um, that basically reteaches boardroom members how to communicate through play so it'll be like okay just like describe the problem that you're trying to solve, whatever that theme of this retreat that they'll put executive board members through um, using a, a Lego diorama, you know, like, and, or coloring or whatever. And that really kind of like levels a playing field where, you know, okay, this is not a PowerPoint or, you know, the, the chairperson of the board really kind of strong arming everything. Um, so I think there's, like innumerable ways to implement play in your life. I'll say mine. I'm obsessed with glow sticks, as the board knows really well. Um, uh, Athens, where I live in Athens, Georgia, there was a little music festival last weekend, uh, local rock bands. And they're my little friends. <clears throat> and they're fairly dramatic bunch of sad boy rock bands who take themselves very seriously and I brought a bunch of glow sticks hundreds of glow sticks to their show and so by the end I'm looking over at this crowd and it was a really cool brewery and yeah but very drama hipster people at the end of a few hours they're like Glow stick, glow stick. I've got my crown, I got my necklace, I got my little bracelets, whatever. Um, for me, play is like a tongue in cheek. Like you can't, you can't resist it because it just is so much fun. No matter how cool you are, put together or professional or whatever, um, it's a, uh, it's kind of a great equalizer because we all once were kids, actually even though some of us don't want to pretend that we ever were. And sometimes I think I was born 30, but no, Nicholas was seven years old at one point and he did play and he did enjoy stuff, whatever. So for me, play is incorporating um, comedy and unexpected joy in moments that you might not have thought they would belong there. That's what it means to me. Thank you, Nick, and thank you to all of you guys for your answers. Kind of going, Reed, specifically kind of going off your answer of what you were talking about. We also had another question, um, you know, bringing 
play into the professional realm. How do you guys feel like that's the best? What do you what do you all feel is the best way of bringing that bringing this play into the into the field of peace or just into a professional setting? Because Nick, as you mentioned, you know people can sometimes think that it's just something related to kids or like you know you're too old for this and everything. Like, what was I guess what are some of your strategies of how you all went about bringing that into the into a professional setting and you know spe- specifically how do you think that can apply to like the peace building setting which can be very technical and and things like that along those lines I feel like to kick this off um and maybe Reed do you want to share this story because it's kind of more your story about the Rock'em Sock'em <laughs> I can share it it's at Lighthouse. Um, so talking about bringing this into a setting where it might not be as normally like accepted or, you know, people might look at it as something for little kids. Um, we brought it to Lighthouse Behavioral Health Solutions again, and people were just kind of like, this isn't for me. I'm going to sit out over here and not engage. And one of like, that's where Reed's kind of the guy that brought in like more of the toy aspect to the parachute people. Um, and I think that's been a really unique way to get people like, I don't know, for lack of a better word, like hooked, like bring bring them in and get them to do some of the other things. So Reed just set down a rock and sock and robot uh, game on a table. And this guy who was just sulking in a corner, kind of bringing the bad vibes was like, oh my God, I want to play that. And then he started doing everything else. And it's like, just kind of giving little activities for everybody to to uh, join in on in a way that they feel comfy doing, um, but that's where I end. <laughs> um, from that, that was actually a really funny instance too because that person that was like saying they weren't going to do it, they were like sitting in a corner smoking a cigarette, and I heard him say like, "I'm never, they're never going to get me to play," and immediately they started, but. Um, I think one thing to uh, comment on is is that play is a universal part of being a mammal, even like being human, being a mammal, whatever. It's how we safely explore our boundaries, our limits as we as we develop, as we grow, and hopefully we never stop doing that, right? And so, play being this mode by which we can safely explore boundaries, whatever, every, um, by implementing that in professional settings, you can really lower the barriers for people to contribute, um, like in a brainstorming session. If, if there's a way that you can make it more playful or put it put a timer on, make people crunch up their ideas in little balls and throw them out, like those are all can be really, really powerful facilitation tools. Um, and they're also just like, get people, like, I don't think working in an office is is like an instinctual part of being a human or the mammalian experience, but, but play is. So um, I think that there's, I, maybe I shouldn't say there's never an inappropriate time to play, but um, like, I think it can be crafted for, you know, just about any situation. Um, I worked in a super, super high volume clinic COVID testing laboratory Um, during the height of the pandemic. We were getting um, 70,000 patient samples in every single day. And so it's like really high stakes, it's super serious. And um, on April Fool's Day, I brought in a couple hundred finger puppets and like, so everybody was, you know, pranking each other, doing finger puppets, like had all that going on, but still doing it within the bounds that were safe within a clinical, highly regulated environment, right? So I think the ways to bring it into professional settings are to kind of empower, letting people know that it's okay, and then kind of creating the boundaries that are appropriate. For me in the hospital, um, it's a... Yeah, it's, it can be very sterile. It's very sad. Um, uh, in the height of when Rushu became the parachute people a few years ago, um, I made a habit to always have a little tiny hand, little you know, like a little tiny on your fingers, and uh, a bubble wand. So having a bubble wand in my back pocket, 
kind of just pop into a patient's room and then just blow a few bubbles and then they get amazed by it. And then I encourage them to, hey, you can blow a bubble too. And just those little interactions of, yeah, things that can just be fit in my pocket. I mean, bubbles, you can get that at the dollar store. You can get tiny hands for a few bucks. Um, I know we're coming up on time, but uh, I wanted to say two things before everyone goes. Um, one, this book here, Play by Dr. Stuart Brown. I'll put it in the comments. Um, that's something that we all went over as a board and it kind of uh, breaks up the neuroscience and kind of like the soci sociology of play and the history of play. Um, and secondly, while people are still on, while I have an active audience, I'll show you how I play. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, I got this thing right here. I got, I've been playing with this little hula hoop and check this out. Yeah, there's that move. Thank you. That's how you play. And I do it because it's fun. It looks, it may look dumb for a while, but break out, break out something you've been meaning to do. And like, I've been admiring people that do hula hoops and I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to buy one, start twirling it. And uh, if there's anything you learn from this, just start playing today, play every day. Audience questions? What we got? Uh, Wada has a question. Uh, this is more of a comment uh, as much as um, a question, but I have this piece of candy. Uh, I don't know if you guys can read it, but I got this at one of my first interactions at eForest, and I definitely, as uh, a person who's not American, who, um, you know, is different, follows a different religion, uh, those spaces of music festivals became uh, a place of community, of healing, of working through traumas, of, um, you know, connecting with people with different backgrounds. I would even say, you know, like E-Force as an example, some of the aspects, there's yoga there almost every day, there are lectures, you can learn, you can grow. Uh, there's something called the giving tree where you present a gift and you take a gift. Um, there's also a, a wall for commemorating people you have lost. And, you know, remembrance, resilience, happiness, all of these things are acts of revolution and things that we learn as conflict practitioners that are extremely essential to moving the practice forward and for successful, you know, community engagement and community building and um, you know, I would go as far as to say as, you know, like, of course, we have this crossover, you know, lecture, but I would definitely say that the parachute people are a, you know, community building or peace building organization, as well as it is, you know, mental health, uh, advocating, and, you know, community engagement. And I love you guys' work. I love everything that you guys shared. And uh, this is probably my, you know, my favorite event that we've had during Peace Week. So, Thank you, Nick and Ron and Ann and Reed and Cam for putting this together and um, love you guys for everything that you guys do. And as soon as I saw it, I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe peace, which is one of my favorite things. And the parachute people is in the same lecture. Um, so um, yeah, conflict book over here is really happy for this space. <laughs> Thank you guys. Uh, yes, we got to get you. We we need to connect with you after this. We need to connect with yes, you. Yes, yes, please, please. Yeah. I would love that. Others, questions, comments, concerns. I wanted to touch on Marissa's question. Did I say your name right? Um, it says, could you recommend strategies to encourage buy-in to play in unconventional environments or with more hesitant participants? Um, I think the, so the, the playground was, we had 20 staff members for the playground, something like that. And basically their job was to play so that people felt comfortable playing, right? So it's it's really like somebody has to be that like instigating energy. Somebody has to be willing to like go out on that awkward limb to like play in front of other people. That's like coloring or building up, um, you know, build it and they will come right so if you if you just like whip out a jenga game and start building it like somebody's going to want to take a piece off of it um 
And then the, another really important thing in the play literature is to understand the different phases, stages of play. So, you know, most of our impact numbers that we've talked about here are like people directly engaging with play. Um, but it's important from a developmental standpoint um, in the play literature that before, before directly engaging with play, people have to observe play, then they have to contemplate getting into play, and then they have to do it. And so just by kind of introducing, like say you only get a couple people in a group um, to play, the other people are observing that, and that is a valid and meaningful intervention in and of itself. Um, so I think th the most important thing is just somebody has to be willing to be the, the kind of goofy person that breaks the ice, right? Um, and it's easier when there are games. <laughs> In a world full of ducks, be a silly goose. I love that quote, Ron. Um, somebody else asked one more question about how they can support you, but I have one more question that I want to ask you guys, which is kind of a, I guess a, a, a wider question. Um, uh, and this kind of goes back, um, I think, Anna, during your presentation, you had mentioned how somebody talked about, like, you know, how they, how they feel like they had met their soul sister or something in attending one of you all's events. So I wanted to ask, what is, like, how do you guys feel like, you know, spirituality, I guess, is, you know, spirituality is pretty intrinsic to peace and everything. So kind of wanted to ask how, how you all have felt like your work has, like, also, well, one, what has it done for you spiritually, like, you know, knowing that you're helping people and also just seeing the impact that it's had, you know, at the events that you all have hosted over the past couple of years since your inception. I think um, one of the most like spiritually touching events, things that have happened for me with the time at the Parish of People um, was we had at, at one of our festivals, we have like a huge camp following. So there, there are like 200 people that camp with us. And then um, we go and activate within the festival grounds. And somebody learned that their father had passed away. And so I was like totally going to go to a different event, a different show. But then like that was, I was like, oh, like this community member had their father passed away. Um, and we had like this huge group that just came and, um, all congregated around this person, um, spoiler, his father didn't die, <laughs> good thing, but, um, he got like that phone call and then got disconnected and so lived in that reality of, oh, my dad's dead. Um, and like we this group of people that have are all kind of played with parachutes before or whatever started just kind of like doing that parachute thing together anyway of like you know that person was standing there somebody put their arm around them around them and then it's like oh wow <laughs> we're standing in a circle and so we started like skipping around to the music and whatever and that was kind of like really cool to see like the same motions and activities bringing people together that we do around a parachute but without that physical parachute there which goes to what nick was talking about it was the lumineers um in the beginning of like the metaphor of the parachute of being connected to people um to support each other and to not just support each other when times are bad but enhance the moments that are good as well yeah that metaphor of the parachute is uh uh, when life's coming at you fast, like you got to deploy a parachute so you can slow down and like really catch you when you're falling. Um, yeah, that was a, yeah, that was, you stole it from me, Reed. Yeah, that was our, that was our good friend. And like some, yeah, there are some like very powerful images, like right there, that was like some true, like true emotions like that just came out. And uh, we were fortunate that, um, one of uh, one of the renowned like festival photographers, David Bruce, was in the area, and he just caught some of the raw, most real, like shots. Um, I was showing like I was showing these photos to a friend the other day, and I've never seen my face make this sort of like like 
shape. It was just like, yeah, it was powerful. And like talking about spirituality, like there was incredible energy. Yeah, it was like, oof. And Casey was there off to the side, and that's our friend who we were just get, getting all the news. And I really believe like there was a higher power in that moment, just like us coming together, like thinking that his father passed, and him later like just updating, saying like, "Hey, he just had a stroke. He's okay." Yeah, that was um, that was something truly incredible. I mean, and that's it's that is the power of community right there it really word kind of spread through camp like wildfire and Casey really just was like oh my god everything we had planned for today we're dropping it and everybody come together and be there for our friend and at that point in time the the friend who we thought dad passed away um had no had never met Casey I don't think or maybe very very briefly I mean this was a very like kind of a stranger but that's the community that we had built is like this is what we're, this is the activity. Now we're going to be there for somebody that needs it, needs us. Um, it was definitely beautiful. Also, that was also where my head went immediately. So. <laughs> I think on the lines of spirituality, part of, part of faith widely defined, whether it's a monotheistic, polytheistic or non-theistic uh, faith organizing structure or not. Um, peace building has always felt to me <clears throat> as a calling it's not a vocation it's not a job I mean yeah you, like you need to get paid to do it um, but how has this work um, impacted my spiritual well-being first off we're not paid I want to make that very clear because this might be a little bit of a different conversation if we were working for our organization. We are unpaid board members who are doing the work. Typically, board, board members don't, in a lot of nonprofits, NGOs, board members are there to advise. We're a working board and we can't take pay from the organization. We don't have money to pay anyone anyways. Um, the The... The thing that has kept me going in 110 heat index at Bonnaroo and the 2 a.m. working calls where we're putting together whatever project management documents and whatever, it's all worth it to me because I know at the end of the day, this is good, honest work. And I know uh, spiritually and intuitively that this is where um this is where i'm meant to be doing this work is where i'm meant to be uh i think for many many peace builders do operate in that space there are some who are here because they fell into the career um and there's certainly nothing wrong with that what i think is really cool about our organization is we are we offer experiences and we yeah please do make donations <laughs> like please. We would love to buy more parachutes and go to more festivals. Um, quick little plug. But uh, yeah, I've always felt that, like I said at the beginning of this, we were all brought together for some crazy, insane reason that I can't fully elucidate. And I don't think I'll ever be able to. But that mystery is kind of why I'm still in the gig. Is the second you figure it out, you've lost it, right? Um and I think a lot of folks in peace building, especially the folks that we work with at MHCR, um, I think they would feel, they would probably have similar things to say about their work as well. Um, you are called, you are called into service. Um, and we certainly were. Well, Thank you everyone for joining us today for a new realm of peace building, exploring the intersection of community, play, well-being, and resilience. Thank you all to the board members for you know coming and sharing your insights. I mean, I'm, I mean, I was the host, I may be biased, but I learned a lot in just this one hour and 30 minutes time. Um, and I, I'm definitely trying to see how I can incorporate play more into the field of peace building because yeah, it can get kind of <laughs> 
can get kind of dry and technical and it's not enough fun in it. And, you know, as you guys have showed us, you know, fun is fun and play is essential to successfully building peace and community. And you guys, you know, through your following and everything, you guys have shown that that's a real, that that's a real solution. Obviously, you know, peace isn't built in one day, but you know, the baby steps that we take towards it and, you know, it comes in many different aspects and you guys are definitely showing, you know, just how, just how multifaceted peace building can be. And so we appreciate you for that. We appreciate everyone who attended today. Um, this recording will be available shortly by the end of this week. Um, and yeah, follow, follow um, the Parachute people on Instagram and Facebook, follow MHCR, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever you got, we got it. And um, yeah, so thank you everyone for joining. And yep, we hope to have more events like this soon. Thank you. Thank you, Cam. Thank you, Nick, for linking us all together. Thank you, 1804 asterisk, asterisk 486, Wada, Lena, Hannah, Giselle, Imari, Charlene, Benjamin, Abad, Marissa, Cam, again. All, you guys didn't have to spend 90 with, minutes with us, but we really appreciate it. I don't know if you guys are getting course credit for this or whatever, but- um, <laughs> Maggie is the 804 number. Oh, Maggie, a uh, little yeah. sister. My little sister. We uh, love you, Maggie. Thank you. No, seriously, thank you guys for tuning in. It's 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 really heartening to have some really listening and um, passionate ears that are just on that same wavelength. So let's uh let's make a make a better a better world together. Thank you so much. Hell yeah! Thanks guys for everything. We loved your session. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you guys. All right. Bye.